Uh, hello, Noah Hutton from Australia. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much. And good to be talking with you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm a bit of a fan of your movie. That's an understatement. When I first saw it at the cinema, I was lucky enough to have a group of friends to talk to about it. And now it's been released um, on digital platforms in Australia and physical media. So I have a copy of my own to keep now. That's that's great. I, I've uh, you know I wanted to get my hands on a physical copy myself, so I'll hope to get one. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to come down under. Have you ever been down yeah. under? I've never been. I've never been. I'm 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 sad that this the opportunity of having a movie come out there didn't get me there, but in another year it would have. Maybe um the lax lapsus sequel, the revenge of quantum. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, is there a director's cameo in the movie that I might, might have missed? There is. Uh, uh, yes, it's there. It's when our, our main character goes to a jobs fair, this, this quantum expo, it's called yeah. in the movie. Um, he kind of walks in and as he's putting his badge on, he walks away and behind him, there's a big TV screen with a promotional video looping. And that's me <laughs> on there. Cool. And did you come under budget? Uh, yeah, barely, yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Just, just sweet <laughs> um, Now, I also believe that you wrote a handbook before the movie was made uh, just to help people with organization and the filmmaking process and relations. Um, what, what made you do that? Well, it was, we were making a movie about labor relations, ultimately, and about the exploitation of certain workers within this big technological boom. So we, did, we thought that it would be, you know, this, is, this actually happens more than you would imagine, but films are made about raising awareness about issues that the film sets themselves don't seem to pay attention to. Yeah. And you see a lot of exploitation um, and, ba and basic sort of ethical boundaries of, of how to treat one another broken in, in filmmaking. And, you know, especially on lower budget films, people's first time films, where it's all about sort of the writer director and vaulting them to the next place in their career and everything. And everyone else there, you know, sort of are the first people to get thrown under the bus uh, in, in ex the expense of make, getting the movie made. So yeah. we thought, you know, what, why not uh, put something together that sort of was an ethical guideline for how to make films a bit differently and to fight against that, that exploitation. Um, so we, we built in a bunch of specific things about back end compensation and, yeah. and hours and, and, um, you know, sick leave and all sorts of stuff, but it was also just about a way to relate to one another, um, and to be aware that that's, that can happen, um, you know, basically it's the first thing that go out the window when the sun's setting and you haven't got the shot yet. And, and, you know, you, you basically the, the lowest people on the, on the hierarchy are the first people to get exploited. So we, we, we tried to fight against that. That's, that's really well done because not a lot of people think of others on set and it's such a group community making a movie. So congratulations on that. And I have, hope people read it and take, you know, notice of it in the future. Yeah, yeah, it's out there. It's publicly available on our on our production company website. People can yeah. take this handbook that we came up with. We adapted it from a, a science lab, actually, that I had done a documentary about. So they can <laughs> they can they can now adapt our you know adaptation and and adapt it for their use on their film set if they so please. But it if in a, if anything, maybe they'll just get the people to um, write their own or come up with a set of guidelines before they start. Because I think part part of the thing is people go in with best intentions. Sure. And just expect that because they're good people, it'll be a well-run ethical film set. And it just isn't the case, you know, either the, the best intentioned people um, can find themselves, you know, running people into the ground for three yeah. weeks into a shoot before they know it. So you, you don't seem like you're a um, in-demand, uh, angry director. What's your uh, you know, personality on set? Are you laid back or do you just have them megaphone every five minutes? <laughs> I'm pretty laid back. I'm just all all about what uh, you know ne needs to sort of happen by the end of, to make our day. Sure. And and uh, you know I I don't but I don't I don't get worked up if we're not if we're not making it. There's always I come from a documentary background and I just sort of always believe and have the faith that even if you don't get exactly what you had storyboarded and hoped for, yeah. you can improvise yeah. in the moment. And that's sort of where a lot of, that's where a lot of actually ideas came into the play and lapses um, into play where that, that 
hadn't been you know scripted because we were tight on time or we got squeezed because of rain and often those elements can lead to productive improvisation so we look we look at it that way uh, it's an in original concept by you i know you've been asked this before but how did you come up with the screenplay uh did it just appear or was it a concept and and something that generated over you know a long period of time it was um a, a little bit of both it it uh, elements of it were, were long gestating. I, I had studied neuroscience in college and the Science world of lapsus. <laughs> yeah, the world of the film with this constant rewiring of these cubes and these sort of human workers had actually come out of an earlier idea I had been working on that was just way too out there, but it was envisioning like a brain world, like sort of the Pix you know, inside out the Pixar movie. Yeah. It was like a real, it was like a real life version of that kind of, but it was, it was never, it never had enough going for it. That was not just done by inside out. So, <laughs> uh, but, but ultimately the world of it, of people constantly rewiring a sort of enclosed microcosm that was extracted. And then I combined that with kind of newer experiences I was having working gig to gig as an independent contractor and, yeah. Under, understanding more what the gig economy was all about. And I think it was kind of a fusion of those two backgrounds that led to the idea, which actually then I wrote pretty quickly and yeah. we got made sort of within two years of writing it. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I found that they could have, you could have elaborated more at times. I, I wanted to know more about certain characters and, and more about the company, but as I said, maybe there'll be a sequel in the works. Well, actually at the, at the moment we're, we're working on a, a TV adaptation of of, um, of the world of the movie, not the same characters and story, but the, the world with all those elements you're talking about would be expanded and explored with new characters and you'd have some of the old characters coming back and whatever. So you know, it's, it hasn't landed anywhere yet, but I'm, I'm working on that at the moment. Has it got a, a working title can you can share? Oh no, it's right now we just still call it Laps. We call it Lapses TV. You know, we'll see, we'll see what it, we'll sure. see what stick. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what's the most challenging uh, writing, directing, uh, composing? You did the music. What's the most challenging, the hardest? Oh, um, I, I, uh, I think that that for me the hardest thing was learning how to work with a with such a a large set at times. So I, I because I'd come from a documentary background, you know, I, mm. I had been used to to very small groups of collaborators and often just myself going in one man banding, you know, a, a documentary shoot. But uh, on this film, you know, we had upwards of 30 people on our crew at times. We kind of expanded and contracted as necessary, but there were some days too with dozens of extras in the background, you know, background actors. And and that was a big challenge for me. I had to, I had to make sure I was communicating well to everybody and I wasn't just sort of off in my own world. And um, I had to, I had to really learn on the spot and there were some growing pains, but I, I really enjoyed that collaboration. It's, it can be lonely at times working in documentary for years uh, sure. by yourself. So it was a welcome change of pace. Uh, did we, we, you sort of touched on it then, um, but did you have problems filming in like the natural habitat, you know, in the forest, in the elements? Yeah, we, 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 we thought we would. We actually had a miracle summer where it only rained during one shoot day. <laughs> And you know we had, we would have been really burned if if uh, it had rained any other days, especially this one week where we only had the robots for five days that were in the movie. We only had five days of shooting with them, and then they were gone. And um, if we if it had rained out one of those days, even we would have really been <laughs> had a had a problem to get what we we're trying to get from them and tell the story. So I, we we were lucky. We only had a half day rained out, and as I mentioned, it led to a really nice change of scenery for one scene in the movie. Uh, a, a scene between the two main characters got shifted into a tent, which was supposed to be out by at, at a yeah. campfire. And I, it was actually a nice development, which I, I I enjoy in the movie now, and it wouldn't have happened without that. So, you you know, we thought we'd be up against more now that there were a lot of mosquitoes, it was very hot, but I can't, I can't really complain about that. We knew we were getting into that. Um, did you ever think of casting your little brother as Ray instead of Jamie? Uh, no, I, I wrote this role of, of Ray for Dean Imperial, the actor who played him all along. So oh, okay. I never, um, I never, I never, you know, was thinking of someone else uh, when I was writing it. And so I, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure actually that my younger brother would pay, play Jamie. 
until a bit later in the process and we hadn't looked at we had gone out and started casting and stuff and then i actually went and saw him up in a school play in college and i uh, i thought he really had some chops that i didn't even know about yet so well that's done. when i cast him uh because i it's a very family affair i also spotted your stepdad in a cameo that's right well. yeah. yeah 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 he's in there yeah i've got to say plain clothes is one of my favorite movies of his and i watch it on a regular basis <laughs> <laughs> okay excellent that's good nick, to know yes nick springsteen always comes to mind when i see your stepdad uh, <laughs> Dan Imperial, uh, I guess it's a bit of a cliche because I, I, I think it's a word that gets used a lot. Uh, he's a revelation, just to be honest. He was great. Uh, he's significant. The performance is just striking and, and chilling at times and natural. How did, how did you cast him? Did you know him beforehand? Yeah, he was a friend of mine. He was, he's really a, a writer. He, he's written on this TV show, Imposters, here in the US a bunch. He's also been a playwright in new yeah. york city and i just was a we have a common friend and we got to know each other through that and i would meet up with him and have coffee and we'd talk about projects and we you know i didn't he wasn't trying to act and he wasn't looking to be looked at as an actor uh, but unbeknownst to him over the series of you know months i i had been telling him about this project i was writing and he didn't know you know i was writing i was he, I, he was my muse for the main character so i would i would meet up with him and you know we would have a chat and i'd really be I'd be studying not just what we were talking about, but ideas for Ray, right? And, and then eventually I, I presented, I wanted to finish the script and get it to a good place and present it to him. Um, but, you know, it just was a hunch I had. And for some reason, you just, it was that little itch. And it really was one of the impetuses to write the project in the beginning, so in the first place, thinking of him out in the woods, what would it be like if this friend of mine, Dean, was trying to set up a tent, for example? This is not a guy who ever goes camping never goes on hikes in the woods. I related. I, I, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I was just, the, you know, the, the little little mind games like that um, to get to spur ideas for new scenes and the kind of mess he might get into out there. And that's how, that's, you know, it's always helpful to have a muse. And he was my unlikely muse in this case. <laughs> uh, what about Madeline, Madeline Wise? Uh, another beautiful, talented uh, casting decision. Um, I know I've seen her before, but this was really more of a lead role for her and, and layers to her character. Did, did you audition her or, or did you know her already as well? Uh, yeah, the, um, Madeline, I, I knew um, a friend of mine again in, from New York and um, I had wanted to make a short film that she would star in that uh, I, I didn't get together. Oh. And then I, I just wrote, I again wrote this role for her. It was written for her. So that's, it's always helpful then. You don't have to reverse engineer it when you write it for someone's voice and affect. Um, you know, she brought something new to the role, of course, too. It's not, yeah. it's not a documentary. Uh, she did wonderful work inside of it. But yeah. I was writing it, again, mused by her and, and what I'd seen her do in other films and TV and then crashing on HBO. Um, and then beyond those two, Everyone else was cast um, in many, many of whom were cast by our casting director, Erica Hart, who suggested okay. um, suggested actors for the for many of the other parts. And then I, I would look at material and meet with them. And yeah, it was, you know, it's, yeah. What's that? Ivory, Ivory is another uh, casting. Yes, Ivory. Yeah. She's great. Yeah. Really good. Yeah, Ivory is fantastic. Are they all involved in the TV show? If you get a chance to use same characters, I know you said they were different, but will you use reoccurring characters yeah many of them will many I, I think most of all the main characters would appear one time or another um they probably won't be the main they probably won't have you no. know uh, a, a comparable position it'll be a lot of new characters but there are some there are a couple characters from the movie that would have their role increased if the tv show as i envision it right now goes forward so it'll be an interesting mix mix and match but uh people who saw the movie I think would would find it fun to see the movie happening kind of in the background of these new stories in the show, little Easter eggs here and there. But other, otherwise, you know, it, it would be a, a thing that people could watch even if they hadn't watched the movie. It would reintroduce all the elements of the world. Yeah, think think of it like uh, Lapsus is Breaking Bad, and your series is going to be Better Call Saul. <laughs> That's right. Reoccurring character. That's right. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> If you were not a, a filmmaker, Noah, uh, what occupation do you think you'd be doing? I think I probably would have gone further with the uh, neuroscience 
um, I don't know. I don't know whether I would have actually been doing experiments or what what part of the field I would have gotten into. But um, I continue, and I just done a long term documentary about neuroscience called In Silico, which is another film that's in festivals right now. Um, and I so I, I continue to be really interested in that field, and I I, I was doing it in college, and I, I probably would have just kept going somehow there. Well, do you think science movies are going to happen more often because? That's a theme that can be explored forever, uh, not just science fiction, but just science in general. Uh, are all your upcoming movies going to be science related, do you think, or will you branch out? So far, every um, I've, I've I've written two more scripts uh, since Lapsus that I'm trying to get made, and and they're all they all have elements of science <laughs> in them, or or you know more or less, but I think they could all be classified within this sci-fi. You know genre and there are a lot of different types of sci-fi um you know I, I i certainly have my own tastes within the that genre but i think it, it seems to be what i'm drawn to yeah uh, i i don't know how often um your parents get brought up but um do, did they sort of want you to come into the business uh were you influenced by them or did they push you how, how did you come into the business were you destined because of your parents to be part <laughs> of the, a filmmaking family? I don't, I, I would say they didn't um, necessarily encourage me to go into the business. I heard it was a very mixed bag growing up. I mean, I, I think I saw the delights of the work that they did from time to time. I did yeah. grow up kind of on sets. I, I didn't go to school um, until I was in, well, until I was about 10 or 11 years old. Yeah. So I was, I was sort of grew up being tutored and brought around on different sets. And it was, a, that was a, interesting way to grow up and I I for as a result I don't find like film sets that you know strange of a place it's sort of natural so I think just like anyone else who grows up seeing their parents do a certain line of work or yeah apprentices with them at one point or whatever I, I you know it kind of just seeps into the pores and sure. we're always watching movies at home and so you know it's just like I there is probably an element of that I was just sort of like there was the world I was growing up in but they when I got into college and stuff I mean, I wasn't a film major. They they were not encouraging me to go to college for acting or filmmaking or anything. You know, I, I they were very much supporting these other directions I was heading in. And I kind of came, I came to documentary filmmaking, which is not something they they do or have ever done as just a, a way to do to explore things I was interested in through, you know, telling stories through film. And that got me all the way back to this, where I've now I'm now, you know, working with them. Of my stepdad, you know, in a cameo role in this film, and yes. and so it's wonderful to kind of come back full circle, and maybe I can work with them more now. Um, well, for my yeah. viewers and listeners who don't know, Timothy Hutton and Deborah Winger are your parents, and I remember seeing them in Made in Heaven. Like, oh, yes. I saw that in a cinema <laughs> in Sydney. It's probably a movie they don't talk about, but I know I remember seeing it, and uh, probably a bit young. You weren't on the set of that one, were you? No, I believe I was just uh being born about that it was about around 1987 i think yes, right? um, yes. Around i was born in 1987 so not 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 really maybe you know not they're on the set maybe in some in some capacity <laughs> um have you had a chance to meet um charlie kaufman or spike jones i i think lapsus reminds me of their earlier work I haven't uh, ever met either of them but i'm I, that's a that's a wonderful compliment because I, I i would say that um seeing being john malkovich uh in 1999 mm. was a, a big moment for me i i it was like i was in high school and i saw that and that awakened a, a real itch i think to want to make films so that was a seminal work in my growing up and i would I, i'm i feel indebted to them for that a couple more questions before we wrap up what movies have you watched lately? Is there anything you can recommend that you've seen lately or a television show that you really enjoyed? Um, I, I would say that uh, this, this last year, I, last year's my favorite film, I think was another round. Um, in general, I think the, the last film that really knocked my, knocked my socks off, it's been a while now, but um, Leosh Kare's last film, Holy Motors, was huge for me. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I that film really rocked my world, and um, you know, I I, I certainly enjoy. Uh, I, I would say that another thing that another uh, not a film, but 
some someone else I was thinking of a lot in writing laps. This was the fiction author George Saunders, uh, okay. whose short stories have been. Uh, I think I think that I, I, his tone of, of of you could call it sci-fi, but it's it's, it's sort of um, hard to pin down even as as that. It's not necessarily in the genre of sci-fi, but his the tone that he strikes with new technologies, new worlds that he builds in these some of these short stories. I was thinking a lot about uh, for lapses. Speaking of Holly Motors, uh, that featured one of Australia's most popular singers, Kylie Minogue. She was in. Oh, movie. right. <laughs> of course. Yeah. What a wild and bizarre movie. I, I just I, I couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. Uh, did you have permits in the forest to film making that system? <laughs> or was it, we was did. It we, had, we actually. No, we had we did have official uh park permits to, to film where we filmed in up in upstate new york yeah now having reviewed lapsus it was hard to not give away spoilers and hard to sort of describe and, and and make people want to watch it so in your own words though um for someone who wants to watch lapsus why should they choose to see it well uh i i think that for people who uh are a fan of the kind of every man sci-fi you know maybe you liked hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy the kind of story of the everyman who who wakes up in the midst of a, a of a world that's passed them by and i i that's a way i feel often in, in the technologies of this world we live in and i think a lot of people i've talked to can relate to that sensation then i think lapsus is a fun watch um and a, and potentially a, a relatable watch for people who um, confront new technologies with some level of bafflement, as well as having a, a potential critique of what these new technologies are and aren't doing for working people yeah. and cr for creating, you know, conditions where people can actually make a living wage and get by in this world. So if you have critiques of the Amazons and the Ubers of the world and the way in which the gig economy has been set up to create some, some winners and a lot of losers, then I think the film might be interesting to watch. And, and the image on the poster, the most posters, are the big, is that big box. Uh, it, was that real? Was that CGI? Did you have, how many boxes did you, boxes did you have set up in the forest? It's real. We, we, there were no, um, vis, no CGI, no, no visual effects done so. after the fact. Everything we, we, we constructed. And um, these, yes, the cube, we only had one of them. We could only afford one. And specifically, we could only afford two sides of it to be covered in metal paneling. So we had a wood frame about eight feet wide on, every, on each side. And then we yeah. could only get metal sheeting to cover two sides of it. So we would, we would pick it up and rotate it as we move the camera around within a scene to make sure that the two metal sides were always camera facing. So there were, you know, we had to get crafty <laughs> on the budget we were on to try to build this world at the scale we wanted. You know. Well, it's it's completely believable for a cube that only has two sides. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Good luck. Uh, I would stop recording.